in the state of Hawaii, under the auspices of the executive branch and the leadership of the governor, there is a department, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, that was the inspiration of Prince Jonah Kuhio Kalanyana Ole. In 1910, Prince Kuhio, a direct descendant of the Hawaiian monarchy and ali'i to his people, was the territorial delegate to the United States Congress. During this time, he saw the devastating effect of urbanization on Hawaiians. Living in crowded tenement quarters of the city, they were dying from disease and economic deprivation. He saw his people with their deep love of the land, the Aina, separated from it and losing their connection to it. To save his people, Prince Kuhio presented to the United States Congress the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act of 1920. The act called for leasing 40 acres of land to each qualified recipient of Hawaiian ancestry. Enough land to plant crops and raise livestock to support a family. Through his hard work, the act became law. Initially, the act was a demonstration project to see if his people would be successful. And the site of this test was the island of Molokai. The first Hawaiian homestead began on the southern coast, centered around the main city of Kaunakakai in an area known as Kalamaula. It was called Kalaniana Ole Settlement. Second-class pastoral lots were the words used to label the land allotted to the first homestead on Molokai, an island so rocky that no one, not even a goat, can live on, was how one of the administrators of the program described the island itself. The lots were formerly a swamp with hard clay-like earth, littered with large rocks, and covered with thick kiawe forests. Purposely given land of poor quality, the homesteaders were challenged to succeed. Undaunted, 70 applicants from throughout the islands applied for 21 lots. By June 27, 1922, eight were selected. The hunger to get back to the land and the desire for ownership was so great that Hawaiians living in the tenements of Honolulu and Hilo abandoned their trade as carpenters and mechanics. Others from rural areas who were hunters, fishermen, and farmers came as well. Once on the homestead, the whole family worked 10 to 12 hours a day, cutting and burning brush, hauling off rocks, so that the one tractor on Molokai could finally clear the land for crops. Almost a year later, the Molokai miracle happened. A bumper crop of watermelons, tomatoes, bananas, and alfalfa for livestock. By 1924, there were 37 families. 278 men, women, and children, all flourishing in Kalanyana Ole settlement. Unfortunately, water soon became a problem. After only a few successful harvests, the water table turned salty. The wells were sucked dry of fresh water, and ocean water seeped in. Other areas on Molokai were considered for homesteading. The largest was an elevated area on northwest central Molokai near the present-day airport called Ho'olehua. Though windswept, the land was arable and water more plentiful. Many of the original homesteaders moved their farms to this new location while keeping their homes in Kalamaula, or they moved to Ho'olehua completely. In 1926, the five-year demonstration project under the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act of 1920 ended. It was hailed a rousing success prompting the United States Secretary of the Interior, Hubert Work, to recommend to Congress its continuation and its expansion to the other islands. This was the beginning of Hawaiian homelands. Prince Kuhio, who died in 1922, would have been proud to see his people back on the land, self-sufficient, overcoming this harsh environment, thriving, raising their children to value hard work and honesty standing tall on the Aina. The story of the first homesteaders of Molokai is the story of pioneers. The following are two oral histories shared by the descendants of the original homesteaders who settled in Kalamaula and Ho'olehua. Oh, mama.
I'm Florence Kaloita and we're in at my home in Holehua. How long have you been living in Holehua? Since 1935, when I married my first husband, Sunny Pa, David Sunny Pa. Well, all I know that my father, my father's name is, was David Kalauhala Pa the third. And then he moved to, he met my mother-in-law, I think. And I think she was the original owner of this homestead. It was under Catherine uh, Rowan Pa. He came from, he comes from the island of uh, Hawaii. And then from there he went to Maui. Then somehow he got to Oahu and from there to Molokai. I don't know too much of the story. That's how he came to farm here. Well, when he first came, he came with my children's dad, David Pa, Jr. And they came over, they planted corn. First they cleared the land, then they started to plant corn. Then vegetables, home use. Then their family moved back. The whole family came back. Oh, there was about 11 of us in the home. Well, there was my father-in-law, David Pa, my mother-in-law, Katie. Then there was my brother-in-law, Duke, my husband, Sonny, myself. Then we had uh, Harriet, Virginia, Eunice, two grandchildren, Eunice, and uh, Lori Lee. There's about 11 of us in the house. My name is Yola Meyer Forbes, and we're on Lot 1, the homestead lot that I live on in Ho'olehua. Well, my mother, uh, Edith uh, Cascott Meyer, was the lessee, and she moved here after Dr. Hanchett and his wife, Mary Hanchett, uh, moved away. And the Hanchets were here in about 1927, and then they left. We came in about 1935. And we've been in the same house on the same homestead since then. She was the original lessee. My mother was born, her mother were, was, lived in Wailua Valley on the east end of Molokai. And then my grandmother got a homestead in Kalamaula when the homesteads first opened around 1924-25. And so they lived there on the beach at Kalamaula, homestead which they still have, the, the grandkids have now. And so we used to live between that homestead and this homestead. It was uh, between the time when I was two years old till I was about six or seven years old. And we had, it was really great because I grew up with my cousins who are, who, whose parents lived on the homestead. My mother's sister, Josephine Wilson, lived on a homestead about a mile from my grandmother. And her two daughters, the same age as me, Herberta Wilson and Emily Wilson, grew up there. And another cousin of mine, Haunani um, Anahu, was raised by my grandmother. So we all grew up there next to the ocean. And, you know, as kids are, we all piled into one big bed and we had a great time. Life was great. We used to catch crabs, you know, with the scoop net. We used to um, catch opais with the opai net. And then we used to look for slipper lobsters, which we call alo and then we'd have those for our meals, you know, with poi, yeah. Oh, it wasn't too bad because it was real family life, you know. We would take turns to cook, my sister and I would take turns to cook, and then we would all eat together. And everybody uh, put up so much, you know, contributed to the house, household expenses. Then we didn't have electricity, but we had gas lamps and kerosene. And that was how we cooked, kerosene and gas. Tell us again where you're when your grandfather-in-law uh, arrived, and uh, did he go to Kalamaula at first, or did he go straight to Ho'olehua? No, they, when I first came, they were living here already. When I first met their dad, they were already homesteading, 
and was that in 1935, and they had been here in 1926. So they already had a new home up when I married their father. When I first came, they had corn. They were planting more corn, but they had vegetable garden for the family. That's how we uh, survived, and they had cattle, and they would kill the cattle, and we would salt it, pork, and uh, that's what we ate. And the chickens and ducks running around the yard. That's how we survived. My father was pretty strict. You had to go to church on Sundays. And then if you didn't go to church, you can't go to matinee. And uh, at every meal, we all said grace. We all had to take turns say grace. And that was one thing he insisted. If we don't eat before we say grace. Well, you know, we were right on the water. And when the high tide would come, it would come under our stairs to the kitchen. And so we'd all run up on the stairs when the water would come in. So we were really living there by the water, and, and that's where our food came from. And it was a good life. I have very good memories of that. Um, we, we all used to want to go to visit my grandmother, and the situation was all of us kids, we each had our own plate. It, life was simple. Our own plate, our own cup, and our spoon. And so we had to take care of it, clean it, put it away, and set, set the table. And so, you know, there wasn't any confusion about what we were going to do. We, we knew what we had to do. And my grandmother always made sure that we helped, helped to go collect food, helped to take care of the younger ones. And so we, we still today, my cousins and I are still very close, just as if we're like sisters, you know, because of that wonderful relationship. Um, my grandmother spoke only Hawaiian. She spoke to us in Hawaiian, but she wanted us to answer in English. So, unfortunately, I never did grow up learning to speak Hawaiian, and some of my friends do, and I'm really sad. That's the only sad part I have, really, about growing up and not knowing my language. But my, and I don't know how my grandmother knew what we were saying in English, but she knew, and we knew, the Hawaiian. And so it worked out just fine. Tell us about the original house. Oh, the house was a large house, had three, four bedrooms, a large living room, dining room, and my father-in-law would entertain people. You know when they have convention? He was a, a strong Democrat. And when the Democratic Party had uh, conventions, or, no, meetings over here, he would bring, they would all come to the house and spend time with us. My grandmother was pure Hawaiian, and she really, you know, they felt that the thing for us was to get educated, to learn to speak English, and that would be a, a major contribution to our growing up. And so my grandfather used to tell us, you have to go to English Standard School, although, you know, it didn't matter to us then, but we did. So when Holomua School opened up, we all went, my cousins and I, we all, we were bussed up there to Holomua Junction to go to school just so we could learn to uh, perfect our English and, and to make it, you know, natural to us. Your father-in-law was also a blacksmith when Yes, he was a blacksmith. He went to commemorative school, that's what he studied. And he had horses, the iron mules, he had mules too. And then he would help the homesteaders. Those days, those hand plow didn't have the uh, the machine. He would help the neighbors across and down here, help them with their land. And he wouldn't, you know, there was a trade system. You do something for me, I do something for you. No money to exchange hands because those days didn't have too much money. Huh? That's how the that's how they worked over here. Well, my father was very what you call. Uh, community-minded with the, with the co community, the com com uh, plantation companies, and even with the church, and he was really into it. And he was the one that brought Libby in into our place to plant. And then uh, at the end of the year, after we were getting $70 a month, and then at the end of the year, we'd have a bonus. Sometimes it's 2000, 20, 2020, uh, 500 like that. And the, the least, I think, was, I forgot how much we were getting. But th that was the most, 2500 And my father would go to Honolulu, and he would give us some money, and he would go to Honolulu and come back with stuff from Honolulu. 
he got enough from the bonus money to buy tractors, right? And once he bought the tractors, how did no, he? No, he didn't get enough, not enough, not that much. He would use that as down payment. Then he would pay by the month, he would pay monthly. And then when he died, uh, we canceled the contract and the white company came back to take the, came to take the trucks back. So with, with, the, with the tractors, how did he make a living? He would go to different homes and help, and they would give us provide the gasoline or whatever they needed. No, no money, you know, was all that. They give things, they pay for the gas and oil or whatever they need. And your father had a, a, a gas tank on, on the property? Yeah, it's right there in a, on the corner, still there, down in the corner there. And Shell was the one that delivered gas to the house. My grandparents on my father's side were Myers up at Kala'e. And so he, he was an accountant and a bookkeeper. And he did all of the bookkeeping for the estate which my great grandfather had founded. And so and he and my great grandfather was a surveyor and so he had surveyed a lot of the land on Moloka'i. And so that was how he was able to to get land. Uh, he surveyed land for for anybody but ma mo mainly the monarchy and they paid him for that. And when they couldn't pay him some months, they would tell him, Okay, you can have a piece of land you know, and so that's how he did get some of the land. My father was Charles Meyer, and he was a, the Hawaiian Homes a project manager for, um, I think, 21 years, but he worked for Hawaiian Homes for over 40 years. And so that really was his life, you know, and agriculture was his main interest. And so he, he knew he wanted to go into agriculture and so he, uh, he did study that. He graduated from Kamehameha, and then he went to two years at the University of Hawaii studying agriculture. And so that was why he was able to farm and raise livestock. And my, uh, my grandfather on my mother's side, well, he was a school principal, and he had moved very early to Honolulu. To, uh, and he was a principal of uh, Lunalilo School in Honolulu. And my grandmother lived here. And then eventually they divorced and my grandmother married a fellow named Maliu from Waialua Valley, Solomon Maliu. And he helped to raise us also. And he was pure Hawaiian. And he, he, would be a, he was a cowboy and he would also do fishing. And so my grandmother would just take care of us. And, and her interest was fruit trees. So she had all kinds of fruit trees on her homestead for us to eat and enjoy. And I think one of my first loves in growing fruit trees came from my grandmother, Emily. Emily Maliu, Cascot Maliu. And I feel that my love for the land and things Hawaiian came from my grandmother mainly my, my uh, mother's mother. And so she used to teach us all, uh, all about, uh, you know, the Hawaiian that she knew and, and their legends and feelings and all. And so that's, that's where it came from, N not from the Haole side. <laughs> Tell us about your, uh, your father-in-law. Tell us that story, why, why he liked to circulate petitions and the story about uh, against moving to Lanikea? Well, well, that was the first petition. Uh, the uh, Hawaiian homes came over here. They had a, held a meeting, and they wanted all the homesteaders to move up that area and farm their land. So my father got together with the Homestead Association, and he uh, drew up a petition. So uh, he's a big man now. Eh? I told we had a great what? He had a great car anyway. So I'd go with him and go to different homesteads and get them to sign the petition that we refuse to move up there to farm, farm down, down here and move up there. The Hawaiian homes wanted us to move up at that area and use the land here for farming only. But then my father-in-law had it, you know, stop. Everybody was, was for it, you know, not to move up there. Tell us about the barge and the produce. Oh, he and Rebecca Maya couldn't get market here. And the Hawaiian homes refused to help them and they had to do it on their own. So he and uh, Rebecca Mayo went to see young brothers. So that's how they took the produce down to Honolulu. 
that much good beer. Or people would come and buy. But you know, they don't buy like, they, you know, you can sell your clubs. So they'll come over here buy corn or whatever they want, sweet potato, Irish potato. But most of the produce would go to Oahu. Well, what kind of money did he get and how, how often did he do this? Uh, about every week. Small, the, the money wasn't too much, but at least it was something. They would sell a bag of corn for dollar fifty cents, and that's about two thousand corn in there, you know, dollar fifty cents. Your father-in-law built the church, uh, congregational church. Tell he was one. He was one of them. When I first came here, the church was there already. The church was about two years old, but he was one of the founders of that church with Mitchell, Mitchell Paoli, uh, Manuel Spencer, several of them. Oh yeah, and uh, Konis, yeah. About five, six families built that church. And what church is this? The Holy Oak Congregational. That's where we members of, and I've been a member of the church since 1930s, 35. Let's jump forward a bit to your father, Charles Meyer. He was a uh, Hawaiian Homes Project Manager, you said, for 21 years, and I think he said from 51 to 72. Yes. Uh, he, he was very uh, entrepreneurial. Uh, just listing what you told me the last time. He, yes. he tried cooperatives, he owned his own pineapple business, he, uh, oh, no, I have to straighten that out. Okay. They, the, a group of homesteaders, uh, while he was the project manager, wanted to have their own pineapple business rather than just going to the you know, big agri-corps. And so uh, a, gr a group of them did get in to uh, form their own pineapple company. And I understand that it was, it was very productive. It was successful. But they had some problems with the transportation, the shipping, and all that. Not because they couldn't grow the, the pineapple. What, what years would, would that be? Oh, I'd, I'd say somewhere, um, somewhere before the, the Second World War in the late 30s and 40s. You know. My understanding is the uh, pineapple companies came in during the 30s and 40s, and at that time, uh, homesteaders would lease their land and, and work on the uh, plantations? Yes. Yeah, the homesteaders, unfortunately, it was a good source of cash for them. So they did lease their lands to the pineapple company, and they got a check every month for it. And so th because of that, they didn't really grow things themselves. But there were a lot of homesteaders who wanted to grow their own um, you know, products and, and went into this pineapple business. And many of them were just growing, you know, they always had vegetables and things to uh, keep the family going. We just didn't have the, uh, the stores and the means to, to get these. And so they used to all grow or go, uh, things or go to fish or hunt, and then they would barter, you know, exchange with, with other homesteaders so that they could have a full range of supplies. There, there was a group of of uh, homesteaders who went in to try to uh, together to uh, grow pineapple. They also tried to form a store. They did form a store, a Ho'olehua um, store where they could bring in supplies for the homesteaders. They even had a formed a, a co-op where they uh, provided coffins for people. You know, after they die, they could supply them with, with caskets. and. Um, all these were difficult to get into the homestead when you needed them. And so they, they, I think they really were creative in trying to bring these things in. It's one of the things that, you know, you, you rely on having your own livestock for the meat. That, but it was hard for each homesteader to just have more than one or two on a rope in the yard or in the field. And so they came up with the idea of a community pasture because there were some Hawaiian homes, pastoral lands, and so they, they hired cowboys, they, they put the fencing in, they had the watermen who put all the troughs in, and then they would brand the, brand the new calves and credit them to the homesteader. And so when they wanted to, to slaughter an animal for food, they would help them by transporting it to the slaughterhouse. Our homesteaders are creative now. We have a wonderful uh, egg co-op, the cooling plant, 
and now the live the uh, slaughterhouse. So I think some of that initiative is still here. You want to know something? Where the house is, this used to be the garage. And right in the back here, we used to have a big vegetable garden. We plant everything in there, in the vegetable garden. And my father had an exotic garden when he had uh, asparagus, cauliflower, all that. Well, he really believed that we plant what, what we plant, we have to eat. We, we're not going to buy anything. If, if you can plant it, you plant it. We're not buying anything, spending any money on what we can do, use at our plant at home. So we never bought, we never bought any vegetables out. Because he planted even his Irish potato. He planted Irish potato. And I would help him go water because those days we didn't have running water. So he would come on his truck and I would stand alongside the road when he come down I would scoop water and water the watermelon by hand. It was hard work but it was good when you had the watermelon it was ready, it was real good. You know, when I first came on the homestead, I was only 17. I would do laundry and then I did most of the cooking because my mother-in-law would do quilting. And my father-in-law was, my sister-in-law had to work in the pineapple field too. So I did the most of the cooking. Did you ever work in the pineapple field? Oh yes, I worked for 15 years. They were hiring women because they didn't have enough uh, school kids to work, see. So I told my, when I heard the ladies were working, I told my first husband I wanted to go to work. Well, him and Mr. Lawson were good friends. So they said, oh, let's pamper her. Let her see, she's going to work a couple of days and she's going to quit. I worked for 15 years, I fooled them. I learned how to pick pineapple by bag. When you pick so many pineapple, not, not less than 12, you, know, you have to pack it out to the truck, waiting truck, and then when we went on the uh, machine, it was easier. When the machine sometimes would go too fast, eh, and we would yell at the driver to slow down. How many hours a day? And, and Eight hours, but then we would have breaks because we had union. The union took care of the, the ladies too. We, we paid, we joined the union, we, we paid due so they couldn't push us. We worked at a regular speed. Well, after Holomua school, I went to Kamehameha. At that time was a girls school in the seventh grade. That was in 1945. And I stayed there, graduated in 1951. And when I, the year I graduated, I was 17. I wanted to go to the mainland, and so in 1951, in September, I moved. I moved there to to go to school in Berkeley, and I went to a small school college called Armstrong College, but I only went two years. I came back to Hawaii, worked in the city, and then um, five years later, my father, unfortunately, had a you know a massive heart attack. And they said, it's time to you, for you to come back to Molokai, help your mom, and take care of your younger brothers and sisters. So I did. And that was in 1953. And so I, I lived here on Molokai from 53 to 58, until my father was back on his feet, and, and the family was OK. And then I said, I'm going back to Berkeley, California. I want some more education. So I did go back in 58. And I started a long, I was very interested in science. And so I started a long haul. I, um, I got a, my bachelor's degree in zoology. And then I, I followed it with a master's degree in um, anatomy. And then I went on to get a PhD in animal physiology. And so that was so from 58 till 69. I got those degrees at uh, UC Berkeley, and my PhD was at UC Davis. I met my husband at UC Berkeley, and we moved to Davis, and, and he was doing graduate study also. So we moved out in 1970 to Ames, Iowa, and we thought it would be great because of the rural atmosphere, and we knew we wanted to come back to Molokai. We would eventually come back to settle on the homestead. So it was a good experience. So we lived there, we liked it so much. We said we're going to go for two years. We loved it so much we stayed 10, 1970 to 1980. And then my, <coughs> excuse me, my dad said he's getting old, you know. He had retired already from Hawaiian Homes in 72. And he, he said, you have to come home and help us on the homestead. And so we did move back in, um, summer of 1980. 
Ms. David K. Paz Sr., original owner of his homestead, picture taken in 1926. Mrs. Catherine Ro uh, Rowan Pa, with David Sonny Pa and the two children, David Falk and Melton. Mrs. Catherine Rowan Pa, the second owner of this homestead, with a good friend, Kalema, Uncle Kalema. And this is Mrs. Uh, Rowan Pa, with grandson, Sonny Boy, and grandniece, Janet Spencer. See, when we first started, my husband and I decided we would try all different kinds of varieties and then figure out which ones do the best. And then we'll settle down on, you know, the ones that do the best. By the way, if you want a good avocado, that's the one. It's green gold. It's just loaded. Eat the tree bears every year, and we get between 200 and 400 pounds a year from a small tree like that. Well, you have to struggle, and we have to, they have to learn the, how to struggle. That's the only way to make life, you know, good over here. I'll never move to Honolulu live for, you know, I just want to visit. I just, this is home to me. Holyo isn't too bad because the families over here are all close. Even if we don't belong to the same religion, we are still close. We help each other. Because over here, money don't, doesn't pass sense, you know. If you want something, you ask, and you have, we give. If I had to do it over again today, I would. This was a good life, and my children are close, yeah? Yeah, I would do it again. Even it was hard work, but I would still do it. Well, this is home. You know, there, there's no place like home, you know? And, and I'm not the only one. All my friends my age, you know, we're pushing 70, and in our early 70s, as soon as you retire, you want to come home. You know, you want to live here, and you want to come to Molokai. It's, it's, there's something unique about it. We like the slow pace, and we, we just love the way the people here, the people are so wonderful. And the, and the land is, is really the main part of it. We're, I think we, we, we grew up valuing the land and what it what it can do and how we can take care of it. I'm really, really thankful for this homestead program and what it has, has given us. My friend who was on, lived in San Francisco for 50 years, Leilani Namahoy, just came home and she loves it. She loves it. She says, I like San Francisco, but it cannot beat Molokai. She said, this is wonderful. And so we know other other classmates who are coming home, friends, who think this is where they want to be, they want to live here until they die, you know. And I'm just thankful we have a place like that, that we can go to or come home to and, and just feel welcome, you know, and like we never left.